The king is coming. This world is a mess. 99% of the mess is caused because we don't do things the way that God taught us how to do them in his word. We have same-sex marriages, which are an abomination to God. I'm not teaching hate. I'm teaching God's word, and I won't apologize for it. It is an ab- homosexuality is an abomination to our Heavenly Father. And anyone who tells you different is not familiar with God's word. We have young folks who don't know whether they should identify with females or males. Can you imagine? I'm, when I was a kid, if somebody would have said that, I would have said, have you ever looked at a puppy? You know? <laughs> You pick them up, you look between their legs, and you know whether it's a female or a male. We have mass shootings in our schools, in our shopping malls, at sporting events. This nation is so divided right now. I mean, I don't think we have been as divided since the Civil War. And in fact, as you hear some people talking about civil war, and that's, that's a sad, sad situation. We have enough enemies without fighting against each other. The world is in a mess. We, we need a king who is capable of straightening this mess out. I have some good news for you. You already know it. The king is coming. The fact that the king would come is prophesied in many, many scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, Let's begin our study today with the blessing that Jacob gave to his fourth son, Judah, in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 49, uh, verse 8. If you would open your Bibles there as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Jacob has already blessed his three first sons. Some of it wasn't all that much of a blessing. But we're going to pick it up with his blessing on Judah. Genesis 49, 8. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. This means you'll be victorious over your enemies. You'll have your enemies by the neck, in other words. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. The other tribes of Israel will bow down before Judah. Why? Well, we're going to find out. Judah is the king line through which Messiah would come, the king of kings and lord of lords. Judah is a lion's whelp. This is a young lion. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched. This could be translated, he crouched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Who would dare uh, rouse up Judah? The scepter, that's the sign of authority. The king's scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh is rest or peace, and the prince of peace is coming. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The king is coming. And I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Well, I thought Jesus was only mentioned in the New Testament. Well, you don't know God's word very well if you think Jesus isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. Many, 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 many places. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 24. We're going to pick it up with verse 14. Numbers 24. The three chapters prior to this, Balak, the king of Moab is trying to hire Balaam to curse Israel. He wasn't successful. Why? Because God blessed Israel, not cursed them. Let's pick it up 
Numbers chapter 24, verse 1. Balak has just basically said, you're fired, Balaam. I hired you to curse Israel, and here these three times you've blessed them. Verse 14. And now, behold, I go to my people, Balaam speaking. Come, therefore, and I will advertise or advise thee what this people, Israel, in other words, shall do to thy people, Moab, in the latter days. Let's see, what are the, when are the latter days? You're living them, folks. You're in the latter days. Verses 15 through 24 are what happens in the latter days. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. His eyes were shut when he was trying to curse Israel, but now his eyes have been opened. How about your eyes? Have your eyes been opened? Don't forget to thank Father if they have been. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, seeing the truth as to what would happen to Moab in the latter days. Balaam's prophecy. I shall see him, referring to Jesus Christ, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. It wasn't time. There shall come a star or a prince out of Jacob and a scepter. There's that sign of authority, the kingship, the scepter of the king shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. This is a bad translation, this last word. Seth was the second son of Eth Ha'adam. Uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, this word, sheth, in the Hebrew is, if you translate it, is confusion or Babylon. And old sister Babylon is going to be destroyed, all right, when Jesus returns. David, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, got a pretty good start on destroying Moab, but Jesus will utterly destroy Moab. Why? Because they seduced Israel into idolatry. No room for that. And notice the star following that verse. That means in most of your Bibles you have a star there. And that indicates that scholars agree that that refers to Messiah. And Edom, that's Rush, Russia of today, shall be a possession Whoa, they're, they're trying to possess other people's territory now, but they're going to be a possession, that old bear, Rush. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly, will uh, do, be prosperous, if you will, with Christ at the helm. Out of Jacob shall come he, that's Christ, the star mentioned in verse 17, that shall have dominion, the kingdom, the king and his dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Again, note the star. And when he looked upon, upon, when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Amalek were, uh, were the people who first warred against Israel when they came out of Egypt. And he looked on the Kenites, the sons of Cain, and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. You think you are hidden and in safety. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher, that's the Assyrian, shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? I tell you, you 
will live when God doeth this. Have you got your gospel armor on? Are you, are you standing, as the song said, standing on the promises? Well, we need to be ready to stand for him in place with that gospel armor on which quench the fiery darts of Satan. And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim. That's the bruisers. That's you, beloved, God's election. You're going to be taking names and kicking dragon, as Pastor Arnold Murray used to frequently say. And shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber. Eber's a region uh, beyond on the east of Jordan. And he also shall perish forever. The bruisers, again, will be kicking uh, dragon, taking names and kicking dragon. There's only one king of kings and lord of lords. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. He fired Balaam because Balaam wasn't able to curse Israel. God promised David that he would establish his throne forever. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, as we continue our study. Second Samuel 7, 1, and it reads, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, this is David, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Temporarily, um, David found one of the few places in his life where there was peace. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. This was a a mansion, if you will, extravagant was a house uh, made of cedar or lined with cedar on the interior. But the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. He's looking out the window from his fancy mansion and he sees the ark of God in a tent, basically. Nathan was a very important prophet throughout David's life and his son Solomon's life. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. This is Nathan's personal opinion. He's not prophesying God's word. He, he, he thought that the Lord was with David because David was having so much success and prospering. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Now we're going to learn what God had to say about David building a house for the Lord. Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? In other words, who do you think you are that you're going to build a house for me? 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 4. The Lord's a little more plain there. He said, you will not build a house for me, David. Chronicles, the events that happen in the Holy Spirit's eyes. Samuel and Kings, more of the events happening through the, the eyes of man. Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked or lived in a tent and in a tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses, which was basically a tent. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel. First Chronicles 17, 6, he says, with the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? God had not asked anyone to build him a house. You know, we need a lot from God. God needs actually very little from us. I'll save, save our love and 
having faith in him, trusting him. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven and earth, the universe. I took thee from the sheep cut, cut from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I gave you the victory uh, over uh, all of your enemies. I didn't find you, David, in a house, a fine mansion lined with cedar walls. I found you in the pastures, a shepherd boy, and I made you the king of the mightiest nation on earth at the time, Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, including the giant Goliath, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. I made you king over Israel. Very powerful nation at this point in time. Nathan the prophet continues, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, this is future, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. This is prophecy of the kingdom of God, the promised land of the future. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, the tares. Who are they the children of? That wicked one. The children of wickedness are going to be put down when the King of kings and Lord of lords returns. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. You're not going to make me a house, David. I'm going to make you a house. A house means a family, a seed line, children. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, when you die, David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. We're not talking about Solomon here. We're talking about out of the root of Jesse, Isaiah 11:10, Romans 15:12. Out of the root of Jesse will this king come. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Again, we're not talking about Solomon. Solomon's throne was not established forever. But when David's, the second man David, Jesus Christ returns, that throne will be established forever. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. To which of the angels did God say, You will be my son, my only begotten, and I will be your father, and you will be my son? The answer is not one. There is only one begotten son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He took the stripes, we get the healing. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. God rejected Saul because he transgressed against the Lord and against the word of God, and also sought out the counsel of a familiar spirit, the witch of Ender. And thine house and thy kingdom, the king and his dominion, shall be established forever before thee. The throne shall be established forever. And again, note the star in many of your Bibles, indicating that that's referring to Messiah, not referring to Solomon. 
Israel, the ten northern tribes, and Judah are now split. But they will be joined together under one king. Turn with me to Ezekiel 37, 15 as we continue our study on the king is coming. Ezekiel 37, verse 15. Y'all are familiar with the first part of Ezekiel 37, which is where uh, God took Ezekiel uh, to the valley of the dead bones. And he said, can these bones live, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel said, Lord, I don't know. You do. He said, prophesy to these bones. And that's what we have today, folks, is a bunch of dead bones. I'm speaking spiritually dead people. And really, when you think about it, it's not their own doing. Maybe a little bit it is, but they've been misled by false teachers. They've been taught the traditions of men rather than the word of God. That will cause people to become spiritually dead. Different subject as we move into verse 15, Ezekiel 37. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying to Ezekiel, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companions. Benjamin, uh, the Levites, Uh, Some of Israelites relocated out of the ten northern tribes because of the idolatry of the likes of Jeroboam and Ahab, who were uh, terrible kings of Israel. Many people moved to Judah to get away from the idolatry. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, Ephraim the larger of the ten northern tribes, often synonymous with the ten northern tribes, and for all the house of Israel his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, one nation, and they shall become one in thine hand. This is future. This has not happened yet. We're still split, Judah and Israel, the ten northern tribes. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? People today need to be shown what this is talking about. Most of them today think they're Gentiles. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, uh, it's Ephraim, the ten northern tribes, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou ridest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. The people are a little bit slow to get things. And I want you to show this example to them. Many, if they saw the example, probably wouldn't understand it, but you do. He's talking about the two nations being joined together as one nation. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. God can scatter a people when they don't do things his way, or he can bring them home. And I will make them one nation. Now that makes it pretty simple to understand. In the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. The two sticks will be joined together. And you know who the one king is, the king of kings and lord of lords. The king is coming. When you see the world in the mess that it is, hold out, have hope. Put your hope in that 
the king is coming. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols or with their detestable things. This is filthy things uh, caused by use in idolatrous worship. Nor with any of their transgressions, rebellion from God, following the Antichrist, for example. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places. Romans eleven twenty six. All Israel shall be saved. Wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people. Ami in the Hebrew. Not lo ami, not my people. Uh, I'm speaking, referring to Hosea. You're, you're, you know where in the Minor Prophets. Ami, my people. And I will be their God. It's going to happen, beloved and David, my servant, shall be king over them. Well, well, hey, David's already passed away. How can David be the king over them? It's the second man, David, Jesus Christ, out of the root of Jesse. And they shall have one shepherd, the great shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. He's returning with that rod of iron. This world that is all messed up, this world that is turned upside down, is going to be straightened out, beloved. The king is coming. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince. This was Nasi in the Hebrew. It's the same word as king forever. The king is coming. The king's already been here once. You knew that, didn't you? He was in the flesh. But there, that was the first advent. When he comes back, that's going to be the second advent. Two verses in Zechariah chapter 9. We have the first and second advent covered. Zechariah, next to the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 9, verse 9, the first advent. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, note the capital K, cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. This prophecy fulfilled in Matthew chapter 21, verse 5, in the following verses. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding lowly, humbly, I'll say, on the foal of an ass. That's, you remember that, that's when the people gathered palm leaves and Palm Friday, uh, or Sunday, I guess it is, came into play there. And the people said, Hosanna, save now. Second Advent, verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. These are implements of war. And the horse from Jerusalem, the war horse. And the battle bow shall be cut off. Micah chapter 4 verse 3. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And neither shall they learn war anymore. And his dominion, uh, back up, shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion, the kingdom, the king and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river Euphrates, in other words, even to the ends of the earth, meaning all of it. His dominion will be the entire earth. The king is coming. But there is someone who wants to lay stake to that throne. He's told of, we're told of him in Revelation chapter 6. Turn there with me as we continue our study. We have an imposter. 
that wants to take his place. He does his best to copycat everything that people think Jesus would do. Revelation 6, 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And the seals are not in chronological order. I think the most important one is mentioned here first. The Lamb, of course, Jesus Christ, the only one worthy of opening the seals. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see the four beasts, the Zun and the Zoi in the Greek and the Hebrew languages. Come and see. And this is being reported to us by John, of course most important seal and I saw and behold a white horse oh let's see good guys always ride white horses not this one and he that sat on him had a bow check out this word bow if you never have done so in the Greek it's toxon it means a cheap fabric imitation it's a rainbow trying to imitate the bow that you would see if you saw the Shekinah glory when you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And a crown was given unto him. That authority of the king was given to him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation 13, 8. The whole world the whole world will be deceived by the Antichrist except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I'll bet yours is there. If you're one of God's elect, I know it is there. As always, Antichrist will copycat the true king. We see the, you see the true king comes in on a white horse as well. Turn over to Revelation 19 as we wrap this up and pull it all together. Revelation 19, pick it up with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready. You're his wife spiritually. Matthew chapter 25, you have those 10 virgins. You know, uh, five of them had enough oil, which is symbolic of truth, in their lamps to greet the, the, the groom when he shows up. Five of them didn't. They said, give us of your oil. And they said, no, you go into town and buy your own. Of course, you can't buy oil. You can't buy the truth. They made herself ready. You are ready for Christ to return. Hepzibah, Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4. That's the name of his bride, Hepzibah. It means my delight is in her. Why does he delight in you? Because you love him. You take time to study his word to understand what is going on in this world, to know what the future holds. Peace of mind is what you have. Verse 8, And to her, Hephzibah, his wife, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Every time you do a righteous act, you add to that robe, that long white robe that you're going to be wearing. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to be buck naked. How embarrassing. Think about it. To, to, to go into the eternity and, you, and your righteous acts or your long gown and you have nothing except an oak tree to stand behind? That would be embarrassing. I, I, I don't want to be in that, that shape. 
And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Some of them are still in town trying to buy oil. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, John is just talking to an angel here to kind of set up this next verse. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Worship God. Don't worship me, the angel saying to John. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, another white horse. This is not the one that we read about in chapter 6, verse 2. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The world's in a mess. He's not coming back, though, as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes this time. He's coming back on a white war horse with a rod of iron in his hand. And he's going to tear up Jake. I mean, he's going to straighten things out. This world that we see, the mess, the disorganization, the uh, total lack of respect for human dignity for each other and total lack of respect and love for our Heavenly Father. It's going to end. It's going to stop. The king is coming. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. All the crowns of the world melted into one. There's only going to be one king of kings and lord of lords. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. I think that name is written of in Revelation 2.17 where it states that white throne with a new name. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Isaiah 63 verse 3. He's going to tread those grapes. The, the wrath of God is going to be poured out beloved, on the wicked. Not on you. You have nothing to worry about at that. But the mess of the world is going to be straightened out. This dipped in blood, it's the blood of the wicked uh, when the cup of wrath is poured out. Isaiah 63, 3 again. And his name is called the Word of God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word that's logos in the Greek. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I know one sergeant that's going to be riding hard right over the shoulder of Jesus Christ. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that two-edged sword of Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. That with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. The cup of wrath will be poured out on our enemies. And he hath on his vesture, his clothing, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The world is in a mess. But we have hope. The king is coming. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for telling it like it is, Father, that we can understand, as a child understands when the truth is revealed to him, Father. We have a group of people here that want to serve you, Father. Continue to reveal your will to us, Father, through your word, through your Holy Spirit, Father. We're always careful to give you the praise. Let everything that we do the rest of this day be the honor and glory of your name in Jesus Christ. 
name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Do I use? I do know that it isn't the oil, but my obedience to Father to use it as the anointing oil of our people. I asked Father to bless the oil and that I would only use it in obedience to Him. I also did the same with the 100% pure olive oil. Did I do the right thing? Which one do I use? Well, both are now anointing oil. Uh, if you're more comfortable using the 100% pure, there's nothing wrong with disposing of the, the other. Uh, oil from time to time should be disposed of. Uh, if the oil becomes old and cloudy, uh, you want to start with some fresh oil. But and again, nothing wrong with disposing it, how you dispose of it. Uh, I usually uh, bury uh, leftover sacraments or olive oil that I'm not using. Uh, you, you do whatever you're comfortable. It's not written in God's Word. But then always start with fresh. And again, don't forget to, as you stated, ask God to bless the oil as anointing oil. <clears throat> James, and I don't know where James is from, can you please tell me what verses the devil messed around with in the King James Version Bible? Well, I think you're speaking of in Matthew chapter 4, where after Jesus had been in the wilderness, the desert for 40 days, and without food or water, that Satan attempted to tempt him. And you can read about this in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, and verse 6 is a scripture that, uh, that Satan twisted. You know, scripture, uh, Satan knows scripture. And, and he, he, he can quote scripture with the best of them, but you have to watch out because he'll throw a little twist in there. And he was telling Jesus that God will send his angels to bear you up. In other words, jump off of this cliff here and God will send the angels to catch you. And then he states, and he, he misquoted Psalm 91:11, which doesn't say at any time. And that's when Jesus said, <laughs> the word also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And you would be tempting God if you stood on the edge of a cliff or a big building and jumped off of it and said, okay, Lord, save me now. <clears throat> that would be tempting God. And God's law of gravity would take over and the ground would come up and smite thee. Yolanda from North Carolina. <clears throat> thank you and thank you for your kind comments. My question is, who is Nahun, N-A-H-U-N? I think you mean uh, who is Nahum, N-A-H-U-M, and he's the seventh of the minor prophets. And uh, Nahum, uh, for one, prophesied uh, the downfall of Nineveh uh, before Nineveh fell. I believe this is Cadence, is how you, I hope I pronounce it right, dear, and Cadence is nine years old. I have a question. My old preacher, Brother Keith, he threw the Bible. Does that make him the Antichrist? No, no, throwing a Bible doesn't make one the Antichrist. Uh, I do think it shows a, a lack of respect for the Word of God. Uh, I guess he was trying to make a point. 
I guess it impressed you that it was probably the wrong thing to do. Dallas from Tennessee, was there some tremendous destruction of the earth between verses in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2? What was the original Hebrew word in the meaning for that destruction? And uh, that's a good question, Dallas, one that very few people know the correct answer to. Uh, the correct answer is Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 states, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period. Uh, that's what happened in the beginning. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18, we learn that God created the earth not in vain, but to be inhabited. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 goes on to say, and the earth was without form and vain. What you need to understand in the Hebrew, the word was should be translated uh, became. Uh, the earth wasn't created null and void, it became null and void uh, without uh, form and vain. And <clears throat> in the Hebrew, that without form and vain is tuhu babuhu in the Hebrew tongue. And when did that happen? It happened in uh, Satan's rebellion. As it's written in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, God shook the earth and the first time. Next time he's going to shake heaven and earth. But when did that happen? It happened at the Greek word katabol, which is when Satan rebelled against God. Ricky in North Carolina, could you teach me the meaning of chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 in the book of Daniel? Um, what does this apply to? And you quote chapter 12 verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. And to go in the dust is a derogatory uh, means of going. And what was it that Satan was uh, sentenced to go on his belly in the dust for the rest of his days? And that is a derogatory statement. Now the last part of this phrase, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt, uh, this occurs at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, all go into spiritual bodies, but only some are going into immortal spiritual bodies. Uh, they are the ones who take part in the first resurrection and uh, that's to awake to everlasting life, uh, some to everlasting contempt. Those are the ones who are uh, deceived by the Antichrist and worship him as it's written in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6. Gabriel in Pennsylvania, I was wondering if God is okay with hunting. I am 11 years old and I'm thinking about starting to hunt soon. Also, did Christians hunt for sport in the Bible? Well, it's nothing written in the Bible about Christians hunting for sport. Uh, they definitely uh, have hunted for um, a way of supporting their, their families to put food on the table. You know, hunting is a great activity. And um, Gabriel, I'm glad that you asked your question because uh, I've been very careful as we work our way through the book of Leviticus to tell younger students that uh, you wouldn't please God if you killed an animal. Now, what I'm talking about when I say that is if you kill an animal and sacrifice it to the Lord to cover your sins. You see, the sins of, uh, of our sins now are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But uh, there's nothing wrong with killing an animal uh, in, the, in the outdoor activity of hunting. Nothing wrong with great, the great outdoor activity of hunting. Dorothy in Texas, 
Is there a verse in the Bible that reads, what goes around will come around? Also, thanks so much for your teaching and you're welcome. We're glad you enjoy the teaching. Psalm 7, uh, verse 16 gets it said, and it's speaking of David's enemy there. And David writes, his mischief shall return upon his own head. And that is the way of saying what goes around comes around. In the New Testament, we have Galatians uh, chapter 6, verse 7, which reads that uh, God will not be mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's a way of saying what goes around comes around. Gerald in Texas, if the Jews are God's chosen people, why is it that they did not believe that Christ is the Son of God? Well, Israel, and that I'm going to clarify, it means all 12 tribes, not just Judah, are God's chosen people. Judah is, the only, is only one tribe, and the good figs of Jeremiah chapter 24 do believe in uh, Christ as the Son of God. The bad figs of Jeremiah 24, which are the Kenites, do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Daryl, I think it is, in Arizona, when the fallen angels come back, do they come back in the same vehicle that Ezekiel describes? Yes, I think so. And uh, if you're not familiar with what Daryl's talking about in Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, and what's going on there is the throne of God is coming to earth because God wants to speak with the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel describes the vehicle that God's throne was transported and the other uh, living creatures as well. And he called it the, of the color amber. And if you'll take your Strong's Concordance and check that out, the word amber means highly polished bronze. So yes, I think the uh, angels that uh, when they come back with Satan we probably will be in some form of vehicle like that. Will we be able to see it? Well, uh, you have to consider they're going to be, the vehicles could be in a different dimension than what you're able to see. Sharia in Michigan. I know about 40, 70, and 120 year generations. Where is the 72 year generation? There is no 72 year generation. There are three different lengths of generation listed in God's Word. You hit them on the head, 40, 70, and 120. Are the two witnesses here, or will we know right away when they are here? Well, no, they're not here. And yes, God's election will know when they're here pretty quickly. Why? They're going to be communicating with God's elect, uh, telling them what's coming up and to get ready. Uh, they, we will, the elect will be receiving instruction from the sons of oil. Leon in New Jersey. I have a King James Version Bible printed in Great Britain in 1936. I am at a loss in understanding Luke 16 verses 22 through 28. I understand there are two sides of the gulf. What I don't understand is this being called paradise. Jesus told the man that was hung with him <clears throat> on the cross, I'll add, being in hell, torment, and flame is not my idea of paradise. He, what he's saying is when Jesus told the malefactor that was crucified with him, this, when he believed upon him, he said, this day I will see you in paradise. Then you go on to say, this sounds like we have already been judged. What am I missing? Well, you see, one side of the gulf is paradise. That's the side of the gulf in Luke 16 that Abraham was seen with Lazarus. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. Then the rich man who didn't live a very good life on earth uh, ended up on the wrong side of the gulf. He was the one who was tormented. And he said, well, you know, if you won't give me some living water, 
to quench my thirst. Let me at least go back and, and tell my brothers. And if they see somebody who's uh, risen from the dead, they'll believe. And they said there already was someone who has risen from the dead and you didn't believe. Uh, Second Esdras chapter 7 verse 77 in the Apocrypha even goes into more description of what it's like on the wrong side of the Gulf. Ricky in North Carolina in the book of Corinthians chapter 7 verses 8 and then 9 more explains to me and all viewers, please explain to me and all viewers the meaning of verse 8 and 9. And he quote verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, meaning unmarried, verse 9 is Paul speaking, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And Paul here is preparing people to go out to teach the words of God. And he's saying you're going to be on the road and traveling. And it's better that if you're like me and abstain, not marry. But if you can't contain yourself, it's better to marry than to burn. And that means to burn with passion. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what? It makes Father's Day when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. Uh, blessings always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to other of our brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, it's this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.